You are listening to the Love Unplugged podcast, episode 17. Have you ever felt completely lost in life and not sure what to do to change your circumstances? My guest today shares her experience of being completely lost and disconnected from herself following the tragic loss of her mother. You will learn what steps she took to heal from her past and her journey to becoming a registered clinical counselor herself, helping other women through their own journeys. Her story completely inspired me and I cannot wait for you guys to hear it. So let's jump in. You are listening to Love Unplugged, a podcast focused on love in all its forms. I'm your host, Jessica Frigon, hopeful romantic and founder of Revue Blanc. I've found that too often love is set aside or taken for granted, and we tend to forget how to care for ourselves and our relationships in the day-to-day chaos. So let's slow down, tune in, and begin our journey of rediscovering love. From honest heart-to-heart conversations with real couples and knowledgeable guests, to deep dive reviews of new products and services that will help you feel beautiful inside and out. If you're looking for relatable advice or wanting to be inspired by real life love stories, you've come to the right place. Without further ado, let's get to it. Hello, everybody. I am here with Catherine Weed, registered clinical counselor, who helps her clients get out of a lost feeling in their lives and heal from their past. Today, she's going to share her journey and what life experiences led her to becoming a counselor herself. So welcome, Catherine. I am so honored to have you as my guest, and I am so excited to learn all about your story and advice. But before we start, for those that do not yet know you, I would love for you to share a little bit about who you are. Uh, Hi, it's so great to be here. Um, Thanks so much for asking me. Um, Yes, my name is Catherine Weed. I usually go by Cat. Um, I am a registered clinical counselor. I have a master's degree in psychology and um, I have an online therapy and coaching practice and I work exclusively with women Um, and I help women um, essentially come home to themselves and and create a more um, authentic relationship with themselves and and truly come to know themselves and in a deeper way. I love that. We all need a little bit of that. (laughs) Oh, totally. (laughs) So when I was looking on your website, um, your story kind of really stood out for me and kind of spoke to to me about my experiences as well. So I kind of connected with you at that point, um, which is why I reached out because it just, I think it's something that... um, people need to hear about because a lot of people experience those things. So I'd love for you to share your journey and what experience led to you realizing you needed to make a change in your life. Oh boy. (laughs) (laughs) I can think of about 25 things (laughs) over a many year period. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, geez. Um, Ultimately, I, the, the true kind of impetus for change happened after my mom died when I was 25. Mm -hmm. Um, and I realized that I, not just from, from that and, and, um, you know, a lot of things that happened when she was alive and in our relationship, but, um, I was not able to be with myself at all even for like 0.001 seconds, you know, everything, um, I couldn't, um, I was full of anxiety. Um, I had panic attacks constantly. I, uh, couldn't, you know, I couldn't stay committed in relationships. I, um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't commit to anything really, a job, a, a town. I, I lived in several different places um, and I just did not know, you know, underneath it all, I just didn't know how to be close to other people. Oh, and I I drank to numb all of that. So there was also that issue. Um, And uh, so basically I was just kind of a wrecking ball for like 15 years. (laughs) Oh my. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so yeah, I really, I just really knew that I couldn't go on living in that way. Um, 
it just, it just, I, I hit the ground, you know, I hit my bottom, um, several times, um, with, you know, decisions, um, you know, and I always joke that it's like, you know, if I had like a, a bunch of options, I would always choose the absolute worst possible life decision for me and for another person if they were also involved <laughs> for, for many years. So I had a lot of, I really did have a lot of awful rock bottom moments, um, you know, and uh, I just, yeah, just full of shame. Yeah, the, the whole, the whole nine, basically. Um, so I really, I decided that I needed to make some changes, um, in my life if I wanted to, um, you know, live really, to be honest, Mm -hmm. really, really, really low, um, for me for, for quite a while on and off. So, um, yeah, that was what I decided. I I chose life, I guess. Good. I mean, that's in the end kind of hopefully what everybody chooses what yeah. exactly caused you anxiety like what was triggering your um panic attacks and things like that um well i i had complex ptsd which i didn't know gotcha um and uh yeah just the whole boatload of unintegrated trauma um you know family stuff um you know my mom died of alcoholism um, and, uh, the whole situation around that was really, really sudden and awful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and just, um, you know, being a, a child, you know, and a teenager in, in that situation. And, um, you know, there was just a, it was sort of the perfect storm of, of everything that, that sort of led to, to, um, to that. Uh, and, um, you know, and now knowing what I know about, about, you know, biology and the nervous system and, and, um, you know, all of those things, I, I realize it's, it's very clear to me what, what was happening and, and why it was happening. It was actually a, a very adaptive, normal reaction to, to sort of this, um, uh, yeah, these experiences that I, that I'd had up to that point. And, and so, uh, um, Yeah. And really it was, it showed up in my relationships too, in a big way. You know, it wasn't just sort of, it wasn't just, um, you know, an inability to, you know, what we call in therapy, self-regulate, like regulate my emotions, regulate, you know, myself. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was, it was really, I could not commit and I could not be close to anybody and in relationship. And I mm-hmm. went from, you know, I went through men like socks in my twenties. It was crazy. <laughs> and, and it was, it was always sort of this, um, this desperate attempt to, to save me from myself. You know, there was never any connection there. It, there was moments of connection, mm-hmm. but, but it was always very much a life raft situation where, um, where, you know, for a second I could feel okay when I was with somebody new or, you know, whatever it was. And, and, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, all kinds of crazy ways of showing up in relationship. Um, that, that really was, was another kind of major impetus too, for, for, you know, wanting to shift gears. It's insane what PTSD can do to someone's life. Mm. Like, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I saw something on your website and it really caught my eye. You talked about how taking a deep breath when you're anxious or when you're having anxiety about something, it's actually not the best thing to do, which was so surprising to me because we're always told that when you're stressing out, you know, when you're freaking out about something, um, just kind of breathe in, breathe out slowly. Right. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about why that's actually not the best way to help you in those situations? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean that it depends. It's dependent on several factors. You know, if depends on the level of, of somebody's anxiety, you know, if, if it's just sort of a, you know, maybe a four out of 10 and it's like, Ooh, I'm feeling a little jumpy you know, and they have the capacity already in their, in their system to, 
um, sort of integrate that that emotional charge, that that physiological charge. Maybe taking a breath is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it really it really just depends on on sort of the level of sort of what we would call hyper arousal in our system. So, um, you know, in general, what what that you know, sort of this whole you know, um, wellness culture around mindfulness and, um, you know, and, and taking a deep breath, sometimes taking a deep breath can masquerade as sort of shutting down what actually wants to come up. Mm -hmm. So, So first of all, just on a purely anxiety level, um, when we take a deep breath in our heart rate actually increases because that's what happens physiologically on an inhale. So when you take a (gasps) big inhale, you know, you're going to feel, you know, more arousal in your system, which creates more fight flight, which creates more anxiety, which is what we don't want to do when we're already mm-hmm. ramped up. Um, you know, so, and, and secondly, it, it's really, um, you know, depends on, on our ability to take a uh, sort of a, a full body mindful breath in, as opposed to sort of a, <gasps> you know, Mm-hmm. Um, that sort of panicked way of kind of like, oh God, this, this really scary emotion is coming up and I just got to, oh, I'm going to grip my teeth and I'm going to breathe through it. You know, mm-hmm. that's often what happens. And, and what we actually want to do, what that is, what anxiety is on a purely physiological level is just excess survival energy in our system. And it, and it wants to arise kind of move up through the peak and then naturally come down it's sort of like it's like a a a mountain you know it kind of comes up it peaks Mm -hmm. and it wants to come down so if it's trying to come up and we're kind of shutting it down by going (gasps) we're actually doing ourselves a disservice and we're sort of stuffing it down further which in the end creates more anxiety so what we want to do instead to work with our stress response with the nervous system, we actually want to, um, to, you know, cultivate the ability to tune in to what's happening in our body. And we don't do this when we're, when we're anxious. We, these are practices that we can, we can practice when we're feeling neutral or good or okay, or great, you know, Mm -hmm. where we can tune into our physiological sensations and track them and follow them around. So that when we are anxious, we can feel our breath kind of, our breath naturally will become shallower. Um, you know, sometimes we'll get into chest breathing. And what we want to do in those situations is not shut that process down, is we want to encourage it and allow, you know, and stay with it and have mm-hmm. the ability, to, you know, and have over time cultivate that, the ability to stay with that shallow breath. Because when we stay with it long enough, it, it allows it to crest over that peak and then our body will actually take, without us even having to think about it, eventually we go, oh, you know, and you might get three or four nice big breaths and they're initiated by the body, not by the mind. And there's a big difference between, um, you know, trying to grit our teeth and clench our fists and breathe through something and actually allowing the body to to do its thing. And, and, and when we do that, we actually, we naturally discharge the stress response. Mm-hmm. Especially again, when we're, when we're, you know, way up, you know, for example, um, you know, in, in the middle of a panic attack or on our way up there, um, you know, it, it really is important that we don't do, you know, something like square breathing, like the in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four. And, and, and again, some, some, sometimes those breath, you know, those ways of breathing are really um, wonderful and, and can be very, very calming, but depending on how ramped up our system is, um, you know, they can actually um, not help us calm down. It emphasizes, you know, the, the, the terror that's associated with those physiological sensations, you know, like, Oh my God, I can't, I can't take a deep breath. And then we kind of get stuck in this loop, um, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so, yeah, it's really, it's, it's just, it's nervous system um, health really. And do you find that 
when you repress or when you don't allow your body to go through those motions, you repress those emotions, which then is really not good for you physically and you'll have to deal with them at some point later on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. You know, we store, we'll store it for later. Mm-hmm. And, and, and again, you know, it, it all depends on the person, on their capacity to feel their sensations and emotions in their body and the level of, you know, and the trigger, you know, mm-hmm. it, if it's full on, um, you know, it's, and we don't have the capacity, um, you know, to, to sort of, um, work with it, 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 yeah, it definitely, you know, we can get into a pattern it's really patterns over time of, you know, like, Oh God, here's my anger again. I'm just going to grit my teeth and I'm just going to breathe through it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and anxiety is just a, it's, it's actually, it's actually not an emotion. It's just a physiological, um, you know, response. It's, you know, it's not a, often we say, Oh, I feel anxious, but it's actually, you know, Anxiety, I always think of it, it's like the lid on top of the emotions that are underneath, like the very human emotions mm-hmm. that are underneath, um, sort of that, that cover. Gotcha. When I was going through um, my experiences, I was very much in survival mode, so I couldn't deal with the emotions that were coming up at that point because there's just too much already kind of going on. So I repressed all those, but because I repressed that, I feel like years down the road, those emotions were coming up and were changing my view of situations and whatnot. Um, having past emotions in the present when, you know, the situation that I was dealing with at that time had nothing to do with what I was feeling. And I was just dealing with some past stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, we, when we are living in our survival physiology like that, we, we actually, it's so normal to not be able to, um, you know, experience our emotions and experience our, our, you know, and have a a relationship with our body sensations, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's, it makes it also very hard to have time and space to have meaningful connections with other people, you know, mm-hmm. when we're kind of oscillating between that sort of way high up in, in our fight flight or that sort of shutdown response that we get into um, because our bodies just can't hold on to the fight flight forever, you know? So we, we get into this sort of pattern um, that makes it very hard to, to access anything, but just sort of going on. And, and that's, I mean, and again, this is all adaptive. Like this is all, you know, if you were being chased by an animal, you would want this. Mm-hmm. You, know, you would, it, it's, 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 we need, we need these responses. We're just not meant to stay in them over time. You know, that's what gets us. Gotcha. So it's, it's not, you know, so often we, we talk about, you know, that, that anxiety or that shutdown is, you know, you know, I've clients said, I just want to get rid of my anxiety, you know, and, and yes, <laughs> A, it's there, it's good information, it's there for a reason, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and um, yeah, and and secondly, like, thank God you have it, because our species, we wouldn't be here, (laughs) we would physically, if we didn't have that response, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a normal, normal mammalian response to, to things that are, um, you know, experiences and situations that are too big for us to integrate as Mm -hmm. as humans. So it's actually pretty ingenious. It is when you really think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of, it's kind of a backwards way to think about it. It's like, these things are actually kind of there to help me, huh? You know? Um, And, and so it's really just kind of tuning in and, and, you know, I'm a firm believer in moving slow. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in my work with clients and, you know, um, and in myself too, you know, you can, you can only move as fast as, as you want, as your body wants to move. And, um, you know, and when we're not ready to face, um, certain memories and, and situations and emotions, 
then we're just not ready. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we really, you know, in order to, to work with those things that are underneath, we really, when somebody's really living in their survival physiology, it, it, we really need to, to work with that first. Yeah. So I want to hear more about your relationships and how they were impacted. Like, did your, your partner know that this was all going internally with you or were they kind of unaware and you were kind of just showing kind of a side of yourself that you felt that they would accept or? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I still have parts of those years that I actually don't have a memory of, um, which, wow. is, which is very classic um, with, you know, when you go through times, times like that, again, it's a, it's a gift from our, it's a biological gift. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really, I, yeah, I, I, I only showed what I could show myself ultimately, which, mm-hmm. which was just sort of, um, going from one thing to the next and, um, not, not being able to really drop into any kind of, um, you know, meaningful interaction. Although at the time, I mean, there, there's always like with everything, there's always moments of, of that, that are, that were authentic, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah. Oh yeah. No, my, my, I mean, and because I was in such a, a difficult emotional space the partners I chose were you know <laughs> were equally had their own thing going on you know um and uh, and it was just sort of you know again in those in those relationships for those you know literally 15 years it was kind of the perfect storm mm-hmm. um and uh but yeah I, I certainly couldn't let people be close to me in any way you know um I just, uh, yeah, I just thought that I was, I really believed that I was just a, a terrible person. Um, and I certainly, because I believe that I, I, in some cases acted, acted in that way where I was just respectful of, of other people, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, just very, very emotionally disconnected from myself, very mm-hmm. avoidant of, of any kind of, um, human interactions, you know, but I I had some great resources then too. I mean, I did have some good friends. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I had a really great time. I was living in Whistler. I lived in, um, Revelstoke. I lived in Tofino. I, I really created, um, this lifestyle that, that sort of offset, you know, it was an attempt to offset the internal turmoil I had going on, you know, and, and, and in some ways it, it saved me, you know, being out in nature and, um, you know, being in the mountains, being in the ocean, you know, traveling a ton, um, you know, those things were really important for me and, and they still are. The difference is that I don't, I don't need to use them in the same way. Mm-hmm. You know that they're more just enjoyable ways of living. It's I'm not on the run anymore. Totally understand that. How do you think you've the result of all of this going on internally had on taking care of yourself on all levels? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I did not even like. No, I didn't even, I couldn't feel me at all. I couldn't, I didn't know me at all. I, Mm -hmm. I I was so um, disconnected and, and actually quite dissociative, um, you know, in, in a way where I, I could, would dissociate from my, my body and myself and, and, uh, and again, another, another, you know, biological gift, you know, it's a place you certainly want to be if you're, if you're, you know in a dire situation, (laughs) but you don't want to stay there. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it really, um, yeah, I had no idea how to, how to care for myself. I would say my, my attempt at self care was definitely, um, you know, 
laughing, <laughs> having a good time with friends, uh, traveling. I traveled a bunch before, you know, long before social media and even email really, mm-hmm. um, you know, where you go with your book and you're hoping the hostel's still there. <laughs> <laughs> this book's like three, four years old. Uh, um, but you know, that was definitely an attempt at, at self-care. Um, you know, I did go to Al-Anon when I was quite young, which mm-hmm. is a support group for family members of alcoholics. And that mm-hmm. was really helpful. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely, I got enough of the good stuff in my family too, to have a base where I could, I knew to reach for things that could help me or at least enough to get me through, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, and I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful for that. And, uh, um, yeah, I, I would say definitely my, my attempt, my biggest attempt at self-care through those years was, was creating a life that resembled more of a vacation. <laughs> escaping, right? Really? What's that? Basically escaping. Yeah, totally, totally escaping, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Changing your environment. Yeah, as long as I was on an adventure that, you know, who knows how it was going to end, I was, I felt safe, you know. Uh, and that's, that's frequently the experience, you know, when you, when you're used to, when our, when our systems are used to chaos, we actually seek chaos. We're a lot more comfortable in chaos than, than, you know, when there was a moment of calm it was just, it would throw me. I couldn't, you know, be, be with it at all. So, um, yeah. I totally get that in the same way. Like my, my day job and my night job keep me very busy during the week. So anytime that I am not going from one thing to another constantly, I absolutely have no idea what to do myself, what, like to do with myself. So I'm like trying to fill that void with more busyness because I'm just so constantly used to having that kind of chaotic schedule. Right. Yeah. Right? Totally. Which is so bad. It's so unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's, you know, once we get to a certain level of sort of our, our body's sense, it's like, I, I actually can't stop. Mm-hmm. You know? um, and I think also that in, you know, I think to be totally honest, there's actually at this moment kind of an overemphasis. I mean, there's a lot of narratives in the wellness industry that drive me nuts. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, spiritual bypassing being a big one. But I think there's a big narrative around, um, you know, we have to be in perfect balance all the time and, you know, having bubble baths every night and all this stuff. And it's like, that's just not life. Like, you're going to have periods where you're busier. You're going to have periods that aren't as busy. You're going to have periods where you feel more ease and flow in your life. And you're going to have a shit ton of walls too, because that's, Mm -hmm. that's just being human, you know? And, and, you know, it's really, um, it's just a bumpy ride and it's learning how to, um, you know, be, be with our experience, um, which Mm -hmm. doesn't involve sitting necessarily on a fancy meditation cushion. It just means getting in touch with, with who we are in a very real human way, you know? Mm -hmm. So why did you, like, what led you to wanting to now study yoga and Reiki and breath work? And can you explain a little bit about what Reiki and breath work is? Yeah, totally. So I, okay. So here's my school story. (laughs) I did my undergrad, uh, right coming out of high school, Mm -hmm. um, in political science. And I thought I was going to be either a lawyer or a politician. I couldn't decide. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I moved to Whistler. <laughs> and I thought, wait a second. I didn't know that I could just enjoy my life here. Um, <laughs> huh. I didn't, that was not an option. So, um, and then I actually went back to school. I thought that I was going to do a master's like in international relations and, you know, go work for the UN or do something, so, do something in sort of, basically be a cog in a very slow moving wheel. Mm -hmm. And I just decided that um, I didn't want to do that. I I, actually, I went back to UBC just to upgrade some marks and I hated it. 
and and through that time I'd had four years of you know traveling and enjoying my life and my mom had died also so I'd had a lot of profound um, experiences and I just realized that um, I was a different person now and I needed to honor that there was there was enough hole in me you know that was still whole and unbroken that I, I was like it pointed me in the direction of the healing arts, basically. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, well, um, you know, at least I got a cheap ski pass out of my UBC uh, course <laughs> <laughs> up a whistler, <laughs> and um, I, um, and then I, yeah, I decided to. Um, the next year, I went to school for acupuncture, actually Chinese medicine, mm-hmm. um, and I lasted about three months. Um, it just wasn't, I, I enjoyed the theories and, um, you know, the traditions of it, but I just, it wasn't, the school was too intense for me at that time. And I just didn't have like, like the wiring in my brain at that time still wasn't, I wasn't able to focus on anything. You know, Mm -hmm. I was, I was an ADHD kid. Um, you know, and I, I was a Ritalin kid also. I was medicated. Um, and I really, I, at that time, I wasn't, I hadn't been able to get underneath a lot of these things that were um, sort of creating that, that normal brain fog when we have a lot of unintegrated things in our, you know, a bunch of unintegrated emotions and, um, you know, core belief systems and, and mostly our, our nervous system, you know, all kind of driving the bus. So I, I remember just leaving there and going, no way. I'm not doing this. So then I decided to go to massage school. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I decided in one weekend, I was going to quit drinking, um, go to massage school and start going to yoga Um, the next day. That's it. You know, (laughs) it's quite the change. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the irony, right? Is we always bring our sort of, I brought my manic perfectionism and sort of my life raft neediness to my healing process, which we often do at the start. And it turns Mm -hmm. into this sort of, well, you know, if everyone else is doing 30 days of hot yoga, I have to do 80, you know? And, um, and it really, you know, we can't not place that template on wanting to sort of quote unquote, get better. Mm -hmm. at the start. So that's really um, where I went with that at the start. And, um, and yeah, and I, I got into, I just knew that I needed to get to know myself and, and really being in a dark room with soothing music with people and not having to talk all day felt really good. It felt mm-hmm. a million times better than where I'd been, you know, cause I, at that, up to that point I'd been working in bars and um, restaurants and, and I just decided that I really needed to, um, make some big changes because I, I was not doing well uh, Mm -hmm. in in many ways, you know? So, um, yeah, so I, I got into that. I didn't, I went to massage school and then I ended up doing my yoga training as I'm pretty sure every other female in BC has done. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. There's a lot of them here. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Um, but, uh, but it was wonderful. I mean, it, it, again, it changed my, relationship with my body, you know, knowing about, you know, and just even being in the body work industry for so long and, um, you know, knowing about my own physical alignment and, and how that shapes our, you know, how our posture, how we move, um, how we are in the world shapes our, our psyche, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and, and so, um, and then I did my, my day, actually, I did my Reiki training before that, maybe a year before that. And, uh, my mom's best friend, um, Marianne, who was sort of like my second mom, she, she, uh, gave me Reiki. She, uh, and for the first time, and I remember feeling the energy in my body and that was actually right after my mom died. So I decided to do my levels one and two, um, Reiki. And that's actually, it's, it's still something I use, you know, I'll, I, I have what I call Reiki naps where I'll just pass out for you know 20 minutes half an hour and with my hands on me and I'll sort of give myself Reiki and it's it's um it's great it's great so I I got really into that stuff I got really 
Um, I Oh, and I used to teach a type of breath work called transformational breath work, which is like a, a type of conscious connected breathing, mm-hmm. um, which is very, it can be very cathartic um, and can bring up a lot. And, and for me, I, I didn't realize this, but at the time I was using it to sort of, uh, you know, really blast myself out of my comfort zone. And I was actually doing more damage than I, than good. But I just thought, mm-hmm. you know, well, if I just keep doing it, you know, if I can just do this harder and more then then it, I, it, I must be on the right track, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it is, it, it is great work again, depending on your attachment history, depending on your capacity to feel in your body. Some people, you know, tap into it and, and it's, it's wonderful. You know, mm-hmm. it just, again, it all is very dependent on, on the individual, you know? And so, um, yeah, so I taught, I taught classes. I gave individual sessions of that, um, down in Baja, Mexico and in Revelstoke where I was living for some years. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was really all just, you know, part of an attempt to be with myself and understand mm-hmm my own experience. That's amazing. That's a lot of learning that you did through all that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I definitely went from the, I started with the body, you know, um, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. I know not, not everyone has that experience, you know, and I just, I feel like I have a, a different, uh, relationship with my body just in knowing it and and feeling so many other bodies too. And, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, things that'll keep me healthy, um, you know, as I age. So that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I'm really, I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of learning those things. So then you, you dealt with your body, but then you had to deal with the mental aspects of healing. So you chose to see a therapist. Um, so how did you feel about going to see one before? Because a lot of people kind of have this sense of, you know, this negative view of going to see a counselor or a therapist, because it means you must be really like broken or, you know, some people really actually are advocates of it. So how did you feel about that before you went? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, um, I mean, I did not know that help was available ever um, growing up. And so, um, you know, and I was rewarded um, for sort of making it through this, you know, these panic attacks. And, you know, I, and I would get them to the point where I'd lose like 10 pounds and not be able to leave my house. And it was very extreme for me. But I remember being rewarded, my mom rewarding me and saying, wow, you know, you're so strong. Like, yeah, you don't need to talk to anybody. God, like, who does that? You know, mm-hmm. so it was very, you know, it just wasn't something I would have ever thought that I would have been able to have support in, mm-hmm. in actually navigating these things. Um, but it was actually after my mom died, my best friend's mom mentioned, she said, Hey, you know, maybe you should go and talk to somebody. Cause I actually, I did see a grief counselor uh, maybe two times right after she died. My dad and I both went to her. Um, and she, she was helpful. Um, mm-hmm. but it, but it wasn't anything that stuck really. And yeah, my, my girlfriend's mom mentioned it. And I, I remember just saying, I'm fine. Like this doesn't even affect me. Like it's fine, you know? So anyway, I ended up going, I ended up finding this therapist, um, who I ended up seeing, um, for, you know, two, three years, um, in Whistler. And, uh, in the first, I think the second session I walked out of. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I was, she, well, she, she mentioned that she thought that I might have a drinking problem and I wasn't ready to hear that. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I remember I may have sworn, um, and, and left, um, and I didn't go back, um, for a year. Um, and, but she planted a seed and, Mm -hmm. um, and I went back when I was ready about a year, a year later. And, um, yeah. And from then on, I really, I really committed to, you know, I, I quit drinking. Um, and I, I was having 
think the reason I went back initially was because I was having panic attacks again. Um, you know, and, uh, and she, she helped me through, through that time, you know? Um, and so I'm, yeah, I, I, again, you know, I definitely feel grateful for having had, had her, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of encourage me through, through that time. Um, you know, a bit more sort of human awareness, biological awareness, you know, normalizing what I was experiencing would have been nice knowing what I know now, Mm -hmm. but at the time, who knows, you know, maybe she was exactly what, what the doctor ordered. So, um, I, uh, but yeah, I'm definitely, it was, it was great to have, to have her. And, and I did, I, that's, I did commit, I committed to her, to seeing her, um, regularly. I committed to, um, going to yoga, which at the, at the start just made my, you know, all of my symptoms and panic and dissociation and all of that kind of stuff a million times worse as it, as it often does. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I eventually worked through that and, and, uh, yeah, so I guess it, it started off. Yeah. I just didn't think that anything was wrong with me. Thank you very much. It's everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then, and then it just sort of, I just w- was totally open to it. Like I had, for whatever reason, I had no shame around it. And I would tell everybody, you know, I'm like, I'm going to therapy. This is the greatest thing ever. There's help out there. Who knew, you know? <laughs> so I, I didn't have any kind of, um, you know, shame that way. And because, you know, my mom's death really blasted everything open and, and my dad and I were, you know, at that time, very open with each other. And, and, um, you know, there was no like, Oh God, you know, it was like, I'm not doing okay. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. It's so funny that somebody could be telling you something that is so true, but until you are ready to hear it or to deal with it, it's like shut down completely. Totally. And it could take like a year. It could take years, like, or maybe even like weeks for you to yeah. finally come to that point where you're like, okay, I'm ready to hear that. And now I'm ready to act on it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We have to, you know, we have to be ready. And that's why you can Mm -hmm. tell friends who are, you know, in questionable relationships or who are sort of stuck with the same thing, you can support them and say, hey, you know, this seems like a kind of a familiar struggle for you. Well, no, 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 this time it's different. You know, Um, we we have to, yeah, you can only move as fast as as you want to move and and not Mm -hmm. you consciously, but you unconsciously want to move. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, you know, conscious, conscious choice really, you know, rarely drives our behavior in a lot of ways. So totally. it's, it's really um, honoring everywhere everybody's at, you know, which, which is why there's no one way every, you know, different things work for different people. And, and I think, you know, culturally, we do ourselves a, a big disservice when we think we know what's best for the other guy. Mm hmm. I love how you said that, you know, at the beginning, you're like, no, I don't need help. You know, therapist, meh, I don't need it. I'm good type thing. And then afterwards, you're like telling everybody, I'm going to see my therapist. It's going to be great because I felt the same way. Like I would get super offended if anybody ever told me you need, you should maybe go speak to somebody or maybe you should like talk to a therapist or something like that. I'd be like, I can't believe you just said that to me. I am so offended. Like, and then when I went, I felt like this huge weight was off my shoulders. I felt like so heard and validated, which I was not getting in my life, which was adding to my anxiety and my issues. Um, and then after that, I was like, I could go every day and talk about me. Like, <laughs> it's like the most relieving feeling just kind of getting everything off your chest and knowing that somebody's hearing you and somebody is there to support you through it and you're kind of dealing with those emotions rather than suppressing them or just kind of putting them to the side to deal with later totally totally and and if you haven't had necessarily safe attachment figures in the past talking Mm -hmm. to a safe person who 
is, you know, where you have a sense in your body that they're non judgmental, they're holding space for you, actually, um, you know, you're basically recreating the attachment relationship in, in those moments, you know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're having a corrective experience with, with somebody safe that you can, that you can talk about yourself with when maybe you've never had that. Mm-hmm. So it's the, the therapeutic, like the relationship, you know, itself is so important. You know, I'm glad you, you said that, that you, you touched mm-hmm. on that, you know, feeling heard. It's like, Oh my God, I didn't know this existed. Um, okay. You know, and, and that in itself can be really healing, you know, mm-hmm. for, for a lot of people. So. So looking back um, through everything that you've experienced and all that you've learned through all your education and, and whatnot, what advice would you have for yourself to get through what you've gone through knowing everything you know now? Mm. What advice would I have for my younger self? Mm -hmm. That everything you are experiencing is normal and adaptive given where you've been. There's nothing wrong with you. And, you know, these are, um, these are, you know, normal responses and ways of defending against pain, Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to shaming myself for um, the ways that I was showing up, you know, and you know, which actually, you know, the irony is when we're stuck in shame and we just think that we're the world's most awful person, that in itself, even though it looks like we're being hard on ourselves, it actually precludes us. It, it prevents us for take, from actually taking adult responsibility for, for our actions because we can't go there. We're, we're in a shame shutdown response. We're not able to process and go, you know, oh, I made a mistake, not I am a mistake. You know, mm-hmm. there's a big difference there. Mm-hmm. So I think I would definitely, um, you know, validate my, my own experience um, and, uh, and just, you know, say, hey, this stuff takes time to unravel. And, um, you know, you got this. There's enough mm-hmm. of you that's, that's unbroken, even though it feels a lot of the time like there isn't, there's nothing wrong with you. I love that. So one of the things that I'm coming to realize in life is that even in every difficult situation that you could experience, there is a gem. There's something in there that is truly a value that can be learned or experienced. So was there anything like that for you in your journey that kind of stood out as, yeah, it was pretty crappy to go through that. However, it taught me this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I just wouldn't, I wouldn't be who I am. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, I simply would not be, I certainly wouldn't have the ability to hold others um, in their, in their difficulty without having, having gone through this. And I really feel, I mean, there's no other job for me. This is what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's what I'm most passionate about and, and, you know, you know, what I'm, what I'm here to do was wrapped up in what I was here to overcome, mm-hmm. I think. And, um, you know, and certainly my, my schooling, um, I did a three-year diploma at a school called Clearmind International Institute, which was um, sort of a combination of, of, you know, well, I was just going to start listing off theories, but who cares? It was really, it was really, you know, transformative and, and really was big on shining a light into myself and my own experience. Um, you know, and then I, and then I did my master's after that. Um, and all of these things really, um, again, were just like the body stuff were really attempts at understanding my own experience and, and, um, and understanding myself so that I could, you know, um, 
integrate those experiences, move through them and, and have a vision for where I want to go and, and have that, that ease and, and more, more ease and flow in my life. So, you know, I would say, I mean, God, all of it really, I'm, I really, I honest to God can say, I look back and, and I'm, I'm really grateful for all of it. So. I love that. How important do you feel the relationship that you have with yourself impacts your life and the decisions that you make? Oh, it's everything. It's everything. Your relationship with yourself is the foundation of, of everything in your life, you know? And you can only relate to the things in your life, including others, to the, 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 the depth and the degree that you are able to relate to yourself. You know, back, mm-hmm. back when I would, you know, jump from relationship to relationship, if you could even call them relationships. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's pretty easy to lie to other people when you're constantly lying to yourself. You know, when you're mm-hmm. in denial, you're, you know, and at that time, I just wasn't ready to... Um, to, uh, it was just too much. It was too much to integrate. And, and I needed to be in that, in that strategy for, for a time. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, until, until I was ready to, to pop out the other end, you know? Yeah. So, um, oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, a relationship with, with ourselves is, is really the, the foundation of my work. And, and, you know, that's what I help women with is finding that, um, you know, starting to, to connect the dots, you know, connect the patterns, you know, ways of showing up in relationship of ways of showing up in life. Um, you know, and it always makes sense given where we've been, you know, when, when all of that, that early programming happens, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it definitely changes changed my my perspective you know learning about that and and I could really tap into my own innocence um and and others innocence a lot more I mean god walking down the street you know, everyone has a story and everybody mm-hmm. is doing the best they can with what they know and there's this real softness and compassion I think that comes from doing that work um on yourself because you you can see it in yourself even if it's just glimpses at first you know um you, you know, and then you can see it in other people. And it's just amazing how so many of us live in our, in our defense and our strategies and our armor and our, you know, blaming or, you know, or self-blame, self-shame, you know, shutting ourselves down, sort of, you know, and oscillate between those. Um, and, uh, you know, rather than, than showing up because we're, you know, 99% of us, where, where the hell we have learned how to do that. I mean, we don't have a template. We have to learn consciously how to do that. So it really, I think just the compassion of, of people doing the best they can is uh, pretty strong. I love how you just talked about compassion because, you know, when I was younger, before everything that happened, happened, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of compassion or understanding that, you know, everybody's going through something and to be kind and um, patient with them. But having gone through everything that I have, I feel like I've come out of it on another side, feeling like no matter what the situation is, if somebody is a total beast to me, even though, yes, okay, their actions weren't okay, I feel like I have a lot more compassion that, you know, maybe they're acting out because of something that they've dealt with that has kind of created this type of environment for them that they need to be able to do that type of stuff or, you know, looking at somebody's circumstances um, and showing compassion for what they're going through because they might have a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that you're not aware of. Totally. Yeah. Beautifully said, you know, you know, we're all fighting a battle that, that other people can't see, Mm -hmm. you know, or we may be, we may not be, who knows? You know, the point Mm -hmm. is we don't know what's happening for other people. Um, So be kind. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's, we, you know, I often talk about survival strategies with, with clients. Um, you know, that are adaptive given, you know, we had to learn these things and these ways of showing up in order mm-hmm. to thrive to the best of our ability. And that's, that's a, an incredible 
thing that we have on board as humans to do that. I mean, we can survive in all kinds of crazy, you know, relational situations, whichever, you know, whatever we, we find that we're born into. So, but we just develop all of these ways of, of, of coping. And, and it's all very adaptive based on what's happening around us. So, you know, those survival strategies follow us into adulthood often, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, and they could be more sort of in the survival or um, um, the actual sort of physiological survival strategies of, you know, the fight, flight, sh- freeze, shutdown. Um, you know, they could be more attachment based, you know, more, more, you know, emotionally you know, certain ways of sneaky ways of showing up in relationship, um, you know, trying to, you know, attempting to get our needs met without actually expressing what we need, which is many of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it, exactly. It, uh, you know, it certainly doesn't also, you know, preclude it. people need to take responsibility if they're being a beast, you know, that's, that's not okay. Um, you know, so responsibility needs to be taken on their part. And then we, you know, need to grow a sense of self where it's like, hey, wait a second, that's not okay. And I'm going to have mm-hmm. a normal emotional reaction to this situation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sort of, I think there's, you know, um, something that I call a compassion bypass that happens where we try to have compassion without feeling the normal, um, you know, important emotions that come with being violated. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm really big on that too. Um, but you know, the truth is at the end of the day, we really are all just kind of acting out in, in a mm-hmm. way that, you know, that worked before. Yeah. Um, you know, unless you come to therapy or coaching and you learn new strategies. Exactly. <laughs> <Dan>. <laughs> So what steps can we take in our lives um, to make sure that we have the proper view and um, we take care of ourselves so that we're attracting the better things in life? What steps can we take? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think it really just starts with getting curious. You know, if there, there are parts you know, in our lives with that don't feel in alignment with us somehow, um, you know, or, you know, or if we're, we're, you know, really feeling highly anxious or, or like we've hit a wall, you know, kind of in depression, kind of more in that shutdown response. Um, you know, it really, you know, when we start to notice that our patterns are patterns. In fact, they aren't just random Mm -hmm. events that all seem to, Oh, geez, this is kind of coincidental, isn't it? You know, (laughs) it's like, you know, really the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. You know, Mm -hmm. we're going to bring that sort of template to, and that blueprint to all aspects of our lives. So I think the first step is, is to get curious about, about, huh, what's this about? This is kind of interesting. I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. You know, how old do I feel right now? Okay. You know, have have I experienced this before? Okay. You know, and what am I making this mean? And and sort of getting curious about our our programming around ways that we relate to ourselves um, and others, Mm -hmm. ultimately, because we relate to others the same way we relate to ourselves. Yeah. Well, this has been a great chat. Um, I just, I love your story and I love how much you've gone through and how you've come out of it in such a better way. Like a lot of people may not have come to where you are at in life now, having gone through all that. So that's just amazing. So it's just so inspiring for me to hear this story. Um, so if anybody wants to learn more about you um, and, you know, what products or services that you offer, sorry, um, where can they find you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. Um, it was really great um, chatting with you. I, yeah, I really appreciate the invitation. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so my website is katherineweedtherapy.com. Um and my Instagram is uh, therapy underscore with underscore cat underscore weed. 
(laughs) Therapy with cat weed with a bunch of underscores just to try to make it more legible. (laughs) Um, And um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, you know, um, you can send me an email. Uh, My email is cat at catherineweedtherapy.com. Um, or you can send me a message on the Instagram or um, via my website. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope that people take the chance to go visit your website and to hear more about your story there and kind of what services you offer that can help them through their experiences. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so thank you so much, Catherine, for taking the time to share your story and for giving us such valuable advice how we can he- heal from our past and lead happy, fulfilling lives. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, again, thanks for having me. I'm Jessica, and thanks for tuning in today to Love Unplugged, the podcast. If there are any questions or topics you'd love answered on the show, head on over to revueblanc.com and share your request with me. If you haven't yet, go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a loved one. Your feedback means the world to me and the community we've created is what fuels our discussions here. After all, this is all for you. Join me next time for another Unplugged Conversation.